All right, Journey Church family, it's time to quiet your hearts and your minds for the Word of God. Pastor Peter Jones is coming to deliver a word that is going to empower you, uplift you, and encourage you in your spirit today and help you to draw closer to God so that you can know who you are in Him and who He is to you. All right, so our new series is called Climate Change climate change. And do you know, no matter what uh, that you experience in life, every one of us experience somebody's climate at some point. Because no matter what relationship you have, no matter where you, where you go, you are in, a, in, in some type of relationship in which there is a climate that has been set. Sometimes we're in a relationship, whether it's in a marriage or uh, that we say, man, my marriage is good right now. And that's the climate right now. Right, but but wait a two more hours, and then then something happens, and then you sit there, you see the laundry on the floor, and you see that this is the third time that you walked in, and no one put the, the cap on the toothpaste, and the climate just changes, right? And then you then you go to work, and you go to your coworkers, and and you sit there, and 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 Miss Cantankerous sits in the same spot with the same grimace on her face all of every single day and you sit there and say look at the climate that I just walked into you go to your boss and you don't know which boss you, is, it, you get the same person but I don't know which boss I'm walking into today <laughs> have you been there have you experienced that you know you're like I don't know which one just showed up today but could you bring back the one that was here yesterday because the climate has changed and we all have mothers and mother-in-laws. Some of us have mother-in-laws. And when they come over, sometimes they just set the climate in the house. I remember, <laughs> I remember <laughs> my mother used to ship sweet potato pie from New York to Michigan because <laughs> her baby had to eat her pie. Do you know the climate that that set in my house? <laughs> thousands of miles away but setting up the climate in my house I'm like good lord <laughs> would you teach her how to make sweet potato pie <laughs> she makes the best sweet potato pie now so I got, I got to say about that <laughs> some of us are dealing with children that set the climate in our house. You sit and go, I brought you into this world. God knows. <laughs> children that set the climate in your house. Some of your children are running your household. Set the climate right. We got, we're going to be talking about it. You're going to want to be here. I'm telling you, the next four weeks, you're going to want to be here because we got to get the climate right. Whether you're in school or, or business or restaurants, you ever go to a restaurant and they just throwing the food at the, on the table? We go to this one restaurant. In fact, if it wasn't for the food, I wouldn't go at all. But the food is so good, I was dealing with the poor service. And I was like, good Lord. And every time we go, my kids go, why do we keep coming back here? Why do we keep coming back? I mean, the, the, the serving staff is just so rude. They reach over. They won't ever deliver the plate around the table, walk right around the table to deliver the plate. They reach over everyone in the, in the conversation to deliver our plate. And we're like, are you serious? Just rude. They just totally set the climate of the meal. We end up talking about them for the rest of the meal. <laughs> because of the climate that they set. You ever get into, you know... <laughs> I travel a lot, so I get, I get off the air, airplane, I, I order an Uber, and when I order an Uber, I automatically have preset settings in my phone. Say, I want a quiet car, I don't, I, I don't want this type of music, you know, I, I, I want the driver to be absolutely silent, because I'm driving usually early in the morning or late, late at night. And you ever get an Uber driver that just talk your ear off the whole, you are exhausted and, you, and they just start talking. I'm like, didn't I order a quiet car? It's like, <laughs> I just, I just want to just have some peace. And, and you think the signals make, the, the, the earphones would make, the, the, the soundproof earphones would make, a, give them a hint, but no, they just keep on talking. 
They set the climate of that whole ride home. So whether you're on a bus in the morning, a train, wherever it may be, there's climate. Every relationship that you have encountered has a climate that is set. And one thing that I do know um, is, is this. I, I happen to go into a lot of organizations and I work with their leadership teams. And um, oftentimes I have the leader take what we call a 360 in which is that they get an assessment of the, their direct reports, they get an assessment of the peers that work around them, and of their boss's view of them as an individual, as, as how they are showing up in the workplace, because they are setting the climate of that workplace. And, and so some people call them climate surveys. Uh, that's where we get in climate uh, from. They call it climate surveys or 360s to just get an assessment of what is happening. And one of the things that is always true, and I know this to be true, is that climate dictates the forecast. That the climate dictates the forecast. And, and, and you may say, well, what are you talking about? If you have a marriage that is full of, that is cold, bitter, angry, hostile, I can predict with pretty much certainty the forecast of that marriage. I can, I can dictate with pretty much certainty where that marriage is going to lead as long as people are cold and distant and feeling bitter and angry or hot all the time. There's a, there's a destination that that climate is setting. There's a forecast that I can project because of that behavior. And, and no matter where you are, you can predict what the long-term forecast is in any relationship by the climate that is there today. I know that there is at least one relationship that you have that you may say could benefit from climate change. There's at least one relationship that you have in your life that you, that you may have more. But as I'm talking, at least one should be flashing in front of you, your face, like neon sign that, yep, this is the stormy guy. This is storm. This, it feels like I'm in a hurricane with this person. Or it feels like, you know, this, this, it's, this has been an icy cold relationship for a long time. You know what they are. You know what they are. You, you've seen them. This is, every time we talk, it's just hot up in here. Just hot. So my question for you as we start this series is, when, what important relationship needs a climate change? What important relationship in your life right now needs a climate change? And you may say, yeah, it's hot, but I like handling the heat. But remember our message last week. It's not about you. It's got to be for the benefit of the other. So what relationship could benefit from a climate change? Is it a relationship with a boss? Is it a relationship with a, a brother or a sister? Is it a relationship with a parent, a grandparent, an uncle? Is it a relationship with a child or a spouse, a relative, you know, once removed? twice removed. I'm trying to hit it all now. I'm trying to get there. <laughs> is it a co-worker? Is it a, is it a neighbor that could benefit from climate change? Because you know what? You have a climate that you enter into that you bring with you everywhere you go. It's not just about them setting it you're also bringing a climate. You know. You know. You're sitting there going, as soon as you see that person, <laughs> your whole face change. And you say, but I didn't say anything, like last week. See, you didn't, you didn't have to say anything. The climate just changed the minute you saw that person because you bring with you a climate 
in every single relationship. That's in connect groups. You can go to a connect group. And you, you've seen it. Some of you have been in connect groups. And that person walks through the door and the whole room changes. The whole thing changes. The, everything changes. Why? Because of the climate that they're bringing with them. And the, the problem is we always think it's somebody else setting the climate. It's easier to believe that it's somebody else that's triggering this instead of us. That it's me, Lord, it's me, Lord, standing in the need. <laughs> when you come to church, you bring a climate with you. Some people like to come to church and they, they, they want everybody to give them all the attention. They're going to cry. They're gonna, and I say this intentionally. Um, <laughs> They're going to cry. They're going to be downhearted. They're going to say all the pity stuff that's going on in their lives just so that they can constantly be fed and given the attention to be restored. You bring a climate in. What climate are you bringing in? Instead of looking to restore somebody else, are you always looking to be the one that's restored? Mm. Climate. We bring it everywhere we go. And you know what's scary? You know what's really scary? is that many of us don't know it. Many of us are go blind to the climate that we set. My kids remind, your kids probably remind you too, but my kids remind me all the time. Well, I'm like, why are you so hostile sometimes? I'm like, why are you responding like this to me? And they're like, well, just look at your face. Just look at what you're, look at, look, look at what you're doing. You know, and I'm like, I don't even realize that I'm bringing a climate to them. And they say, just the look may be judgmental. Just the look may be accusatory. Just the look may, and I'm like, I'm not doing that. And they're like, yeah, you are. Go ask somebody else. You see, we don't know what the climate sometimes that we are bringing in to the situation. We're oblivious to it. But just because we don't know what the climate is that we're bringing doesn't mean we shouldn't find out. I'm getting to somewhere. I'm going someplace. It's important for us to, to discover the climate. When I go into these corporations and I do that 360 and a, that, that climate assessment for them, what I'm doing, I, I interview sometimes their, all the people in their departments. I interview people, their coworkers. I interview their subordinates. I interview the, their bosses and people that they interact with. I, I interview all of them just so they understand. I get all this data so they can capture the climate that they're setting. And one of the things I realize is that the number one killer of people's careers, the number one killer is the inability to understand the emotional climate you and others bring into the workplace. Is that means I'm not aware of the, I'm not aware of what I bring and I'm not aware of what's happening right now by the emotional state of those that I've encountered in the workplace. I'm unaware of both. And the goal is, Daniel Goleman, actually, who, who wrote a book on emotional intelligence about the climate that people are setting, did this research from Sanford University. And he says, this is a killer. We think intelligence and skill and ability is what's going to get us there. No, it's not going to get you promoted. It's not going to get you to the next level. What typically gets you there is your ability to understand and be aware of the emotional climate that you're setting, that you are bringing and that are impacting your space. No more reason. So it's imperative. Just because somebody's smart doesn't mean that's going to get them there. It is imperative for us to understand and get this right. Because it's not just impacting our workplaces. It's impacting our very lives with our relationships, the most important relationships in our lives. So how can we get a handle on this? Because I believe that the Bible, and the Bible confirms this, is that your relationships are the greatest assets you have in life. Can I say that again? Your relationships are the greatest assets you have in life. You need to, so we need to get this right. And, and you may say, well, Peter, how are you basing this? What are you basing this on? The Bible tells us this. Jesus himself tells us that relationships are the greatest assets that we can have in life. Not what we do, not what we acquire, not who I am. 
It's the relationships that I forge. It's not my ability to, to be independent, but it's actually to being more dependent with those that God has sent into our lives. He says it this way. He says that uh, in Mark, the 12th chapter and the 28th verse, he says it this way. This is Jesus talking. He says, which is one of the commandments that, that one of the men in the audience were listening to Jesus as they were trying to trap him. And they say, what is the greatest commandment? And he says, he says, Jesus says, the first in importance is love the Lord your God with all your passion, prayer, and intelligence and energy. He says, basically, he says, I want you to love God, enter into a relationship. Love is a relationship thing. It's a verb. It's an action thing. And he says, I want you to love God. I want you to do this with everything within you, with all, when, when you pray, um, with all of your mind, all the intelligence, all the information that you've acquired throughout life, and with all energy, I want you to love God. That's a relationship issue. Jesus says that's the most important thing that you can do is enter a relationship with your God. He goes, by the way, the second one's like the first. He says, love others as well as you love yourselves. He says, there is no other commandment that ranks with these. This is so important to love God and to love others. This is the central theme throughout the entire Bible. You can say, I don't understand the Bible. Well, let me break it down to you. The most two important elements is to love God and love others. He says, if you could fashion your life around that, I can tell you, you're 90% there. You're 90% there. So I have to focus on the relationships as being my greatest assets. And so how am I managing the relationships with those that God has put into my life? So what is the most important? What are the important relationships that need a climate change in your life? I'm not going to stop there. I want to go to a biblical story where this is, this is seen over and over again. But it starts from the very first family in Genesis. So if you go to Genesis, the fourth chapter, we're going to start at the third verse. We're going to talk about uh, the early family where this was more pronounced than anything, being able to manage our emotions. Because it's time for climate change. Let's go there. Genesis 4 and 3, it says this. It says, now we're talking about Cain and Abel. This is the, the first children of Adam and Eve. And it says, time passed, and Cain brought an offering to God from the produce of his farm. Abel also brought an offering. So his brother Abel, Cain and Abel are brothers. Abel also brought an offering. But from the firstborn animal of his herd, choice cuts of meat. So we got one brother, he brings fruit. He's a farmer. We have another brother, he's a hunter, and he brings meat. God had already, and, his, and Cain and Abel's parents had already taught them how to approach God and how to bring an offering before God. They already told them what, and, and instructed them on what the right thing thing to do was. Now you see divergence. I'm going to bring what I think I'm going to bring to God, one brother says. And the other brother said, I'm going to bring what my parents taught me to bring to God. That's a whole nother message, but I just want to just leave that thought in your mind that they were taught and instructed on how to approach God. And there is a way. You can't just do it any way you want. There is a method. And so look at it. let's go back into the story. So God liked Abel and his offering. God approved of the meat offering because he says life of the flesh is in the blood. There is no blood in fruit and in vegetables and things of the land. So he says, I need a blood offering. And so Abel brought him that blood offering and God approved of it. But Cain... And his offering didn't get approval. Let's go on. It says, but God liked Abel and his offering, but Cain and his offering didn't get approved. Cain 
lost his temper and he went to sulk. Look at it, here it is. Look at the emotion starting to rise. Cain knew what to bring. He, did, he brought what he wanted to bring. He says, this is the attitude I'm going to have towards God. This is what I'm going to do towards God. He should just accept me just the way I am. And he brought his own climate to God. God rejected it. And now Cain is leaving and he's angry. Your Bible may say he, had, he, he got angry. He lost his temper and he began to sulk to stew, to play it over and over in his mind, to justify his own action. He sat there. His emotions began to, to turn to where he got angry, and he began to blame others. He began to see things differently. I want to tell you this. One of the things that happens when you see your, when, when your climate is, is affecting something else, what happens is you start to blame everybody else. Isn't I'm reacting this way. I told you I struggled with anger. I just said it earlier. I struggled with anger for years. And, and I would sit there and go, well, they're making me angry. If you didn't have to say it that way, it's not them. That's something in me. Nobody else is triggering that for you. That's you. And you need to unearth what's going on with you. And, and instead of sulking and projecting and portraying and thinking it's somebody else, we need to evaluate what's going on here. What's going on with me? And I know this is, this is not a popular topic, but we need to know it. We need to get it right. Cain began to stew and to sulk. And remember what I told you? Climate determines forecast. Your climate will dictate the forecast. So just on this alone, I can begin to extrapolate where Cain is going to end up. Just by him sulking and stewing in his emotions. And I'm telling you, some of us, I want to pause for a moment because some of us, we need to look at what is that emotion that we tend to stew in. We, that, there's a trigger that gets set. And, and it's like a click in the door. You hear that click in the door, and you, you immediately, it triggers something in you. And, and instead of projecting and saying, well, it's because I was brought up like this, and, and no one ever listened to me, and I just like to be heard. And so when I don't feel heard, there's the trigger. And, and so that means it's not somebody else doing something to you. There's something that you haven't dealt with to learn how to master and manage your emotions. And you can blame and sulk and blame somebody else. But today God is telling me to illuminate that for you and to tell you to start looking at yourself. Look at you instead of someone else. What is that emotion that's being that trigger that's driving and is hurting the relationships, your forecast, your future relationships? What is that emotion that's affecting that? Here it is. So God spoke to Cain. Look at what God, God is. God, that's, God is so great. He goes, God says to Cain, he says, why this tantrum? Why are you sulking? Listen, he's saying, Cain, I recognize that there's something that you're bringing here, that there's an emotion, there's a climate that you're setting. Why are you setting this climate? He's raising Cain's awareness. Remember I told you the, the very two reasons why people, uh, careers go down is because, and they're not successful in their careers, their careers are limited, is because they're not aware of the emotional climate that's set. Here God is making Cain aware of the emotional climate that he's setting. God is bringing it to his attention. I want you to be aware, Cain. Look at this. Why are you sulking? He says, if you do well, if you do well, won't you be accepted? He says, wait a minute, if you do what's right, if you do what you know to do, there'll be no reason for your sulking. There'll be no reason for you to be angry. 
It has nothing to do with Abel. It has nothing to do with anybody else. You know what to do if you work on yourself and you do right. He says, won't you be accepted? He's trying to get him to see the benefit of making the change to managing his emotions. I want you to start looking at whatever it is for you. What is the benefit if you got this under control? I could tell you. <laughs> I'll just tell you about me. <laughs> I can tell you, I, I began to have more open dialogue with my kids and, and with my wife because I had learned to get my anger under control. The, the fear that they may have been walking around failing to share what's on their hearts, share what's on their mind because they were afraid of my reaction began to reduce because I learned to get that under control. What is standing in the way of the relationships that you have and what is the benefit if you get this right? If you get this under control. I want you to start looking at it that way. Don't look at it as, he's, this is what God is trying to tell Cain. Don't look at it as if this is something somebody else is doing. You need to get this under control. This is your responsibility, Cain. But it's right. Goes on. He says, and if you don't, mm, I don't even need to say more about that, do I? See, he's saying, look at the forecast. Look at what's going on. Look at the, what's in your future. If you don't, sin is lying in wait. Now, some of you automatically go spiritual on you because because of the word sin, all right? So let me just break down that word for a moment. Sin is an English term that was used to mean fall short of the bullseye. Fall short, archery term, fall short of the bullseye. So the guy used to, when they shot and they hit the bullseye or they missed or they went and came off mark, they would say, sin, they raised the flag, and they would say, sin, you fell short of the bullseye. You fell short of the mark. You fell short of the goal. It wasn't a spiritual term. It was an archery term. So now, let's get back into the word. It says, and if you don't do well, you will fall short. You will miss the mark. What mark are you going to be missing? What is the goal that you want with the relationship that you have? What do you hope that relationship to be in your life? And what happens when you miss that mark? It never reaches its full potential because you fail to work on you and managing your emotions. What's happening? Why is it falling short? It's never measuring up. He says, it's waiting for you and it's ready to pounce on you. And, and it's, it's, gonna, it's, it's ready to pounce. It's out to get you. You got to master it. You have to master it. You have to master it. Whatever that emotion is for you, you have to master it. Otherwise, it's ready to pounce, which in other words, it's going to take control of you. It's going to, you're going to be labeled by it. You ever, you, you, you probably already know, you, you've probably done it. You've gone into work and you say, oh, that's, that's that manager, that's the crazy one. And, and you call it crazy, but what you're really saying is they're erratic. They're, 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 they always, they blow up. They're explosive. You know, you're, you're labeling the behavior that, that you're seeing, and you say, it, because it's mastered them, they haven't mastered it. Where is it? That it's easy for somebody to say, yep, this is the one. This is what they always do. I knew that's how it was going to turn out. You have to master that 
emotion. So let's go on to the next verse, the eighth verse. It says, so Cain left. He heard God raised his awareness. He left and he had words with his brother. You see, he's still blaming someone else. Well, let me get, let me get my brother straight. No. Instead of taking the feedback, instead of taking the information that was given and using it to help him, he still blamed someone else. I have this happen all the time. I, 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 when I do that, that survey, I go and I interview people and I, I give people a survey for that 360. I, I tell people when they get the data back from me and they sit down and they're reading their report, I tell them, I said, you can, you can make this report be your worst enemy or it could be your best help. You can sit there and look at it and say, well, I know exactly who said this. And they said it because uh, they feel this way. And you can come up and you can blame and, and cast doubt. Or you can say, this is an important piece of information. How does this fit in with the other pieces of information from people that I, I admire that are also saying something similar? And if they're all saying something similar, maybe there's something that I need to do. It can help you or it can hurt you. You could use it as a weapon or you could use it to help you and build you up and change your forecast, change your future. And so Cain had words with his brother and they were out in the field and Cain came at Abel, his brother, and he killed him. Your emotions kills. Your emotions can kill your relationships. Are we aware of that? Our emotional state our emotional responses, if we don't master it, will kill the relationships that we have if we don't learn how to manage them. So God said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, how should I know? Am I his babysitter? In other words, do you notice what he did? I want you to pick this out. He immediately moved from relationship with his brother, to employment. It's looking at himself as, am I a hired servant for my brother? There's no longer a relationship. His emotions has totally distanced himself from the relationship that he had because he didn't learn to manage it. He didn't learn to master it. And so he changes his, that, that dynamic. There is no longer a relationship between him and his brother as a result of his emotions. And so Cain said to God, so God punishes him and Cain says to God, my punishment is too much. I can't take it. What happens is, and this is what happens when your emotions take control over you. What, what's happening here is, is his emotions took control over him. And now he's, he's spinning out of control and he's saying, I can't take this anymore. He stays in an emotional state over and over again. The emotional state continues to plague him. He doesn't move forward. It, it continues to drive. He sees everything through the lens of that emotion, and it's continuing to drive. You know, I, and I hear this all the time when, when um, I just talk about me. When someone, <laughs> when someone disappointed me, and I thought they should, they should have done something different, whether it was right or wrong, it doesn't really matter. But I had an emotional response. Do you know, I would go to work, and this because this happened at work, I would go back to work. Every time I saw that person, I'm looking for reasons to be set off. I'm looking for a reason for that person to, to, to just pull, hit that trigger so I can pounce on them. I know I ain't alone. Y'all act like this is just me. It's just me, right? Just me. Nobody else do that, right? Because our emotions cloud our, our image. We, we start to see things through our emotions, and it's driving decisions we're making. It's driving, I mean, where we can be productive. We'll give people advice based off, based off of our warped view of someone or the world or a particular situation because of our emotional state has taken control. This is, this is an area we got to get right. 
And so Cain began to see everything. He says, this is too much. We see things in extremes and we see things as unfair. He begins to play the victim and he sees himself as a need to fight back. Where is that for you? You're ready to fight back, but it's really you that you're really fighting with. You're going to fight somebody else, but it's really something in you that you really need to fight with and get under control. But you see it in everybody else. He sees himself as the victim. And yet, you've thrown me off the land. I can never again face you, he says. He's talking to God. I'm a homeless wanderer on earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. This is the state I'm in forever. I'm going to be, I, I am marked. I, I, I'm I, the victim. But look at God. Look at what God does. He begins to blame God. He says, I can't even come near you. My relationship with you, God, is now impacted. Some of us are dealing with emotions that our relationships with God is even impacted. We can't, we can't get past something because our relation, we can't get in a good relationship with God and see God in a certain way as a deliverer, as a helper, as a redeemer, or whatever it is in our life because we're dealing with our, this issue, this emotional thing, struggle that we have. But look at God. God told him, no, anyone who kills Cain will pay for it seven times over. God put a mark on Cain to protect him. To protect him. God says, my grace, my love will never allow you to be harmed. I'm still for you. Even though he disagreed with the behavior, he says, I'm still for you. I'm still here to protect you. I'm still, I still want a relationship. See, God knows exactly what you're dealing with. He knows exactly why you feel the way you feel. And he's basically saying, hey, I'm still going to protect you. I'm still on your side. God is a God that, that is a God that say, yeah, the truth is that you did bad, you did wrong, but I still like your wrong, crazy, nutty self. That's grace and truth. In fact, it says it no better than in John 1, 17, where, where it says, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth, that, the, that, that God's grace, his, his forgiveness, his love for you is still there, and truth. He's still going to say, hey, get your act right. Work on yourself. Master those emotions. That's the truth of the matter. But he still loves you. You do that with your kids. Say, I still love you, but I ain't going to let you stand like that. I ain't going to let you keep going through life like that. I'm gonna, you're going to hear the truth now. <laughs> but I still love you. That's grace and truth. And so Cain left the presence of God, and he lived in no man's land. He lived in a place of no relationship. No relationship because he failed to master his emotions. I told you that, that's a great tragedy. Where is it that you're losing out and you're missing out? Your forecast is dictating that you're going to miss out on great quality relationships because you fail to manage your emotions. And you're saying, I'm lonely. Let me sign up for the connect group class. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to be lonely there too if you bring that emotion in there. <laughs> Manage it. <laughs> Get it right. He lived in no man's land east of Eden because climate determines your forecast. Climate, determine your forecast. So this is what I want you to do. This is my, my assignment for you this week. I know this is true. Is that your forecast and your relationships will remain the same until the climate begins to change. So what are you willing to do to change that climate? Now, you may be asking yourself, what do I need to do? There's got to be an important relationship in your life that you want to change. So I want you to do this assignment for me. This week, I want you to ask at least three people, at least three people. I want you to ask three people. I want you to get your pen out. You should be typing in your phone. This assignment, this is for you. 
take a picture of it. You, you're like, I'm just listening and see if this is something I want to do. I know that look. I know that look. <laughs> I told you truth and grace. I still love you, but I won't tell you the truth. <laughs> get, your, get ready. This is what I'm going to ask you to do. I want you to ask three people this question because sometimes we can't see it ourselves, right? We can't see the climate that we're bringing in. So to bring it in, what Jesus did or what God did with Cain, God made him aware. So I want you to ask three people this one question to help raise your awareness of the climate that you're bringing. What is it like to be on the other side of me? What is it like to be on the other side of me? Now, don't just ask the, the soft the, the softballs, the, the low, the, the easy thing, the easy people. You say, just, I love you, Nana. <laughs> like a five-year-old gonna tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all think it? I'm, I'm reading your mail. I got you. <laughs> I asked three people, for, uh, Pastor. <laughs> All my grandkids. <laughs> no. Three people in your life. What is it like to be on the other side of me? And when when you ask that person, this the, this is the appropriate response is silence. That means I need to listen. I need to listen and then thank you. There's no justification. You can ask questions for clarification. When do you see this? How often does this show up? You can ask for clar clarification. Those are clarifying questions. That's it. Thank you. Take the data. Just take the data. Take the data. And the reason why you need to take it, you need to take it and then you can bring it to God. You take it, bring it to God, meditate on it. Say, I'm going to bring it to God in prayer. God reveal my, open my eyes to see. Give me the, the courage to, to face this emotion that is, is lying in wait, ready to pounce on me. Ready to take control that is affecting my relationships. Lord, open my eyes so I can see them. I can see when it's happening and so that I can master it. Because he says, if you don't master it, it's going to master you. What is it like to live on the other side of me? Now, men, we have a tendency not to want to hear questions like this and answers to questions like this. But we need to hear it. And what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to say, well, I do everything. I dry, I'm bringing in the bacon. I'm, I'm making the bacon. Well, guess what? Ladies are too. And we always say that it's easy for ladies to have these discussions. They always have these discussions. No matter where you go, they have these discussions. They, they'll talk about anything. Well, guess what? We need to talk about it too. We need to understand the climate that we're setting. And we can turn around our sons when we get master of some of the emotions that we're dealing with. And remember, the forecast, your climate dictates your forecast. What is in the forecast? Where, where are your children who are looking at you? What, are you? what is the example that you're setting with not knowing? That you're sitting there going, if I get this right, I can turn around the relationship I have with my kids. And always... The urgent thing, the busyness of the day, is going to drive out what's important. What's important that needs to be done. But I can tell you this. We're all born to die. And there's no one on their deathbed that I've spoken to that sit there and say, it's because of all the work I've done. My family's proud because I, I brought in all this money and I, 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 brought, I worked up the career, my, the career ladder and I, I moved into these places and I got this big house. No. At the end of the day, it's all about the relationships. The important things is the relationships. And so before we get to the end, let's find out now how we can improve it and prioritize what's important. So we should ask the question, what is it like to be on the other side of me? I'm great at work comes to house, comes to home, not so good. 
I take feedback here. I, I don't take anything when it comes to feedback in my personal relationships. What is it like to be on the other side of me? Let's be clear and ask the question. Three people. Ask four if you're lucky. Feeling, feeling, I really just want to get more people out there to give feedback. But remember, the response is silence and thank you. That's it. Silence and thank you. How many of you are going to agree to, to do that assignment? See, you're not saying it to me. You're saying this to God. I mean, <laughs> you're agreeing. All right, all right. It says, and, 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 and you may say, well, Peter, that's, that works in the corporate world. But that's not biblical. I came here from a biblical spiritual response. Well, I'm glad you asked the question. <laughs> Proverbs 15, 31 says this. If you listen to constructive criticism, you will be at home amongst the wise. If you listen to constructive criticism, you will become wise. But if you reject it, you reject discipline, the discipline to do what's right, the discipline to master your emotion, you only harm yourself. Biblically based. Are we willing to accept the feedback that others are giving us to help us? Because if you listen to constructive criticism, you'll be at home amongst the wise. But if you reject it, What is it like to be on the other side of me? Why don't you stand with me?